The Honorable Member for Yukon. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm certainly pleased to rise today to begin the final day of third reading debate on Bill C-19, ending the Long Gun Registry Act. As I said last week, this is a very proud day for long gun owners and indeed people who are fiscally prudent and taxpayers in our country from coast to coast to coast. We are yet one step closer to fulfilling our long-standing commitment to ending the wasteful and ineffective long gun registry once and for all. I am pleased to tell Yukon citizens, trappers, hunters, athletes, sports shooters, collectors, and First Nations who rely on long guns to protect their heritage, culture, traditional way of life, that the long gun registry, as promised by our government, is finally coming to its rightful end. Mr. Speaker, long guns have been a staple tool in Yukon since its beginning, before it was designated as its own territory. And Mr. Speaker, this is indeed true of Canada itself. Throughout this process of debate, we have heard all the reasons why our government is opposed to this misdirected legislation. We have heard how wasteful the cost of the long gun registry. It has surpassed $2 billion. Can you imagine how many police officers that money would have hired? How many crime prevention programs could have been funded? How, many, how much rehabilitative treatment could have de been developed? And how much victim support it could have been provided? And when you stop and think about it in those terms, it, the, it is an absolutely grotesque and astounding waste of money. We've also heard that, this in, that it's ineffective. Throughout the entire process of this debate, whether it was in second reading or during committee stage, or frankly, for the last 17 years, there's not been one person who can convince me that the long gun registry has ever stopped a single crime or saved a single life. What will stop crime, mind you, is smart prevention, effective policing, and deterrent sentences. That is the approach to criminal justice that this Conservative government is taking and will continue to take into the future. The single biggest impediment to police work today is paperwork. Crimes, by and large, are not solved from behind a computer desk. There is as much value today for good old-fashioned, on-the-street, door-to-door efforts as there ever was. This holds infinitely true when we discuss crime prevention. Crimes are not prevented from behind a desk. Supporters of the Long Gun Registry continue to claim it will help the police. Ask any officer, would you like a partner or a computer and a database? And overwhelmingly, the answer will be a partner. But $2 billion blown by the Liberal government went to a database that did nothing, and the police are now buried in databases wrought with errors. What do I know about this, Mr. Speaker? I was a member of the RCMP's Troop 4 in Depot Division the year the Liberal government shut it down. The second last troop to graduate before a complete closure of depot for the first time in 125 years of the RCMP's existence. Troop 4 was told well past the midpoint of training that depot would be closing and there would be no jobs to go to. And so, for the first time in 125 years, facilitators met with our entire troop to say you may remain to graduate, but there will be no jobs. How can the Liberal members stand now in this House and say that the registry keeps Canadians safe and it keeps police safe with a legacy like that? It keeps police behind desks. It keeps police buried in data so they aren't on our streets to prevent crimes. And the $2 billion waste of could have been $2 billion spent on a partner every officer would love to have. Now that would have been $2 billion well spent. And after all the fear-mongering, and hyperbole that the opposition has continued to use at every single juncture of the debate, I thought it would be a useful exercise to once again review with everyone what I like to call the seven myths of the opposition that they have repeatedly misled Canadians with. Myth number one, that the long gun registry will help keep suicide rates down. During committee, we clearly heard evidence from peer-reviewed studies from Dr. Kelman Langman, PhD, Division of Emergency Medicine, the Department of Medicine at McMaster University, and he stated, and I quote, the discontinuation of the registration of non-restricted firearms is not likely to result in an increase in the aggregate suicide rate by long gun. And further, I treat suicide and violence on a daily basis. The money that has been spent on the long gun registry is unfortunately wasted. However, we can prevent further waste 
by taking the money we currently spend on the long gun registry and spending it on women's shelters, police training and spousal abuse, and psychiatric care, which is sorely lacking in this country. We are not winning the battle against suicide. Myth number two, the long gun registry will keep women safer. During committee, we clearly hear, hear heard again peer-reviewed research which demonstrated that the discontinuation of non-restricted firearms will not result in an increase in homicide or spousal homicide rates through the utilization of long guns. And this only makes sense, Mr. Speaker, because the people registering their long guns are not committing these crimes. These are men and women who are impeded by the red tape and the stigma associated with being a long gun owner. But they do their civic duty despite the unnecessary and wasteful burden imposed upon them and register their firearms because their government tells them it's the law. Meanwhile, criminals don't do any of this. They enjoy the freedom to operate outside of the law and have all the rights and protections of the law. The opposition attempts to, to position this debate as, in long guns as men against women, an offender and victim. On committee, we heard directly from women, women who hunt, women who trap, women who have represented our great nation in international shooting competitions. The opposition would like Canadians to believe that it's only men who own guns, and this is simply not the case. Madame Helene Laurent, volunteer coordinator of a Quebec women's hunting program, said this at committee, as a hunter, I don't think it's fair that we are being treated like criminals. The registry does not protect women any more than it does society as a whole. Myth number three, guns will now be as easy to get as checking out a library, uh, a book at a library. The opposition is ignoring the facts and they are deliberately misleading those who don't own long guns and who aren't familiar with the process. I can tell Canadians, as any long gun owner can, that the requirements for licensing is not changing. And this includes Canadian firearm safety courses and for some, additional firearms hunter ethic and, and safety development courses. And of course, pre-screening security background checks. Myth number four. Police support the registry and elimination of the registry will put police in danger. But here's what we heard from law enforcement personnel on committee. And I quote, I can tell you that the registration of long guns did not make my job as a conservation officer any safer. That was brought to us by Donald Welts, an Ontario conservation officer. We heard about a survey conducted between March 2009 and June of 2010 of 2,631 police officers from all across Canada. 2,410 of those officers voted to scrap the registry. In April 2011, a further survey of Edmonton City Police concluded that 81% voted in favour of scrapping the registry. We heard that the Auditor General found that the RCMP could not rely on the registry on account of a large number of errors and omissions. We heard numerous times individual police state that they don't trust the information contained in the registry and they would not rely on that information to ensure their safety. Myth number five, the data should be saved and turned over to provinces who wish to create their own registry. The registry is the data and our commitment to the Canadian people was clear. Anything less would be disingenuous. The data was collected under federal law for a federal purpose and it will not be turned over to another jurisdiction. The committee heard evidence that the RCMP had reported error rates between 43 and 90 percent in firearms applications and registry information. We also heard that the manual search conducted discovered 4,438 stolen firearms had been successfully re-registered. With these errors, it would be irresponsible to the extreme to allow this unreliable, ineffective, and grossly expensive system to be handed over to anyone. Myth number six, registering a long gun is no different than registering your car. And what did we hear in committee on this assumption? Solomon Friedman accurately stated that unlike registering your car, failure to comply or errors in the application process have criminal implications. Mr. Speaker, you won't be going to jail or receive a criminal record if you fail to register your car. Myth number seven, registering your firearm is simple, so what's the harm? Again, Mr. Speaker, the harm is that any mistake has criminal implications and the mistakes in the registry are staggering. Further consider more testimony from Mr. Friedman, where he quotes, 
I have two law degrees. I clerked at the Supreme Court. I practice criminal law for a living, and even I, at times, find the provisions of the Firearms Act and the gun control portions of the criminal code convoluted, complex, and confusing. If this is the case, Mr. Speaker, how can we expect average Canadians to navigate this quagmire without error, and how can we have criminal consequences as a result? How can we expect our law enforcement officers to interpret and apply complex and convoluted legislation with discretion and consistency if a criminal lawyer, well-versed and studied on the subject matter, finds it difficult? Linda Tom, who is a Canadian Olympic gold medal shooter, said, I am accorded few legal right, fewer legal rights than a criminal. Measures enacted by Bill C-68 allow police to enter my home at, a time, at any time without a search warrant because I own registered firearms. Yet the same police must have a search warrant to enter the home of criminals. I am not arguing that criminals should not have this right. They should, I am arguing, that is the right should be restored to me and all Canadian firearms owners. Mr. Speaker, I would finally like to highlight the conclusion of, of uh, Gary Mauser, PhD, Professor Emeritus at the Institute for Canadian Urban Research Studies at Simon Fraser University. And he concluded, responsible gun owners are less likely to commit murder than other Canadians. The long gun registry has not demonstrated its value to police. The long gun registry has not been effective in reducing homicide. And the data in the long gun registry are of poor quality, therefore should be destroyed. And that's exactly what will happen. Mr. Speaker, our government has made a clear commitment. Promise made, promise kept. However, I would also like to focus today on some of the other insincerity offered by the opposition. First and most flagrantly is the NDP, Her Majesty's loyal opposition. This party, sadly, has caved to the big Labour special interests. Numerous members of that party from rural Canada told their voters last spring that when they went to Ottawa, they would put the views of people ahead of cheap partisan politics. Boy, were those people misled. For example, the member from Western Arctic stated recently and repeatedly that he would vote to end the long gun registry. Mr. Speaker, he campaigned on this knowing full well, and in his own words to the Slave River Journal as recent as June of 2010, and I quote, 95% of the emails he received from the Northwest Territories constituents supported eliminating the long gun registry. The member has now stated in this House that he will vote against ending the long gun registry. It appears, Mr. Speaker, that he is willing to disappoint his constituents, turn his back on them by failing to defend their traditional, cultural, historic, and present day way of life. Why would he do this when he stated in the same article that he believed he would be able to vote as he saw fit? And I quote, the NDP has a policy of not whipping the vote on private members' bills, so people are allowed to vote as they see fit. Alas, the answer. The member from Western Arctic is not prepared to face the wrath of NDP, NDP bosses and suffer the consequences. But not every member of the NDP is willing to break their commitments. And I'm referring to the members from Thunder Bay Superior North uh, and, and the member from Thund Thunder Bay Rainy River, who both had the courage to stand up and vote with the Conservative government to end the long gun registry. Unfortunately, we know how that story went. The heavy handed union bosses in the back rooms in the ND of the NDP spoke and spoke quickly. Immediately, these MPs were stripped of the ability to speak up for their constituents. These sorts of intimidate, intimidation tactics are reprehensible, though frankly not surprising, from the disunited NDP. Mr. Speaker, let's also look at the Liberal Party. They have not been as cagey about their position as New Democratic colleagues. The Liberals were clear, prior to the last election, that all Liberals would support continuing the wasteful and ineffective long gun registry. And now, thanks to ignoring the will of their constituents, the once great big red machine has been relegated to the back corner of this place. And Mr. Speaker, don't think for a moment I have any problem with the Liberal tactics. Without these ham-fisted actions by the opposition, our caucus might not have been blessed with the great talents of, uh, such as the member from uh, uh, Nisiping to Missing, among others. And despite their two different approaches of ignoring the will of their constituents, the NDP and the Liberals have something in common. They both support criminalizing law-abiding Canadians through the Long Gun Registry, but oppose punishing real criminals through tough and appropriate sanctions. This is something that I simply fail to understand. It is the firm belief of the opposition that individuals should have the force of the criminal code, the most powerful tool at the disposal of the state, thrust upon them should they fail to fill out some paperwork to register their rifles and shotguns. And at the same time, 
The members of poll, the members opposite, grimace and grumble every time our government dares to suggest that those who are trafficking drugs to our children should get serious jail time, or that those who have sexually abused children should never have the benefit of having their criminal record erased. The position not only lacks serious elements of common sense, it is morally bankrupt. All reasonable people agree that individuals must be licensed to possess firearms, and we are not changing that. What we are doing is simply taking steps to eliminate a needlessly bureaucratic process that has done nothing to protect the public safely. Anyone who believes that putting a piece of paper next to a firearm that makes it safer is not being honest with themselves. Let's be clear, firearms in the wrong hands are dangerous. That is why we are ensuring appropriate licensing still takes place. Firearms in the hands of law-abiding Canadians, however, are merely tools. They are no different than any other piece of property. This again returns to my confusion as to the priorities of the opposition regarding criminal justice. When I go back to the Yukon, I hear the same refrain from all sorts of people. They say, why are law-abiding gun owners treated like criminals, yet criminals are getting off easy? The only answer I have for them is to look back at the history and the legacy of Liberal governments throughout the years. Our government is looking to take action to correct both of these historical wrongs. We will end the wasteful and ineffective long gun registry once and for all, and we will ensure we develop a correctional system that actually corrects criminal behaviour. That is what we were elected to do, and that's what we will do, Mr. Speaker. It boggles my mind that any reasonable individual can oppose this bill. There are two fundamental halves. Firstly, as I have touched on, is keeping Canadians safe through effective gun control. Our government does not believe in measures that simply make people feel safe, but we're concerned about actually making people feel safe. Effective gun control exists through proper licensing and ensuring only qualified individuals have possession, of have possession of firearms. As I've said before, a gun in the hands of a law-abiding Canadian is just another piece of property. A gun in the hands of a criminal or the mentally ill only leads to tragedy. The Long Gun Registry does nothing to prevent the latter. That is done through screening and licensing, which in fact we have recently increased investment in. That is how people are truly kept safe. The second half of the bill, which is equally important, is protecting the privacy of all Canadians. For many years, the Long Gun Registry made ordinary Canadians uh, feel like criminals for no other reason than the fact that they happened to own a firearm. They were required to register in a cumbersome and paperwork-heavy process. They were required to submit into a database a list of legally owned private property, and all for merely having the audacity of being a long gun owner. Diana Cabrera, the Canadian Sports Shooting Association, from the Canadian Sports Shooting Association, testified before committee, and she said, I quote, there is no question that the long gun registry has deterred individuals from entering their shooting sports. She went on to say, firearms owners are subjected uh, to spectacular press coverage in which reporters tireless, tirelessly describe small and very ordinary collections of firearms as arsenals. And now some may say being in a database hardly constitutes being a criminal. There are all kinds of databases. The problem lies with the attitude. Firearms owners are taught that they need to be ashamed of their hobby, that somehow, because they own a gun, they are more likely to become a criminal. This needs to stop. Mr. Speaker, that is completely untrue. On law and order matters, police and the firearms community tend to march in lockstep. However, the long gun registry has thrust a wedge between these two groups. In many cases, firearms owners rightfully feel that they are being targeted by police officers for simply owning a hunting rifle. While the police are merely doing their job and enforcing the laws it stands, a culture of division has been spawned by the policies of the previous Liberal government. Eliminating the wasteful and ineffective long gun registry is an important first step in correcting this needless division of Canadians. The fact of the matter is that once we eliminate the long gun registry, there will be no change in public safety. Effective gun control still exists. What will change is that once and for all, gun owners will be able to feel good about owning their gun. I see my time is coming nearer to an end, Mr. Speaker, and I would just like to conclude that... Uh, we have seen a, a number of steps taken that are, that are simply divisive politics. We saw, as an example, on two separate occasions, billboards designed by the NDP to provoke fear in urban communities, which had silhouettes of dangerous-looking firearms, and they implied that these scary guns would be everywhere should the registry be scrapped. Plain and simple, they were wrong. Those firearms were displayed and are restricted and are still subject to gun control measures. 
I call on all members, especially those members who campaigned on this promise, to stand with our government and vote to end the long gun registry, putting an end to this liberal-led attack on our Canadian culture, tradition, history, and day-to-day -day life of north to south, rural to urban, coast to coast to magnificent coast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.